Well, hello and Happy New Year to you all. Thanks so much for stopping by our channel. If you haven't already done so, please take a moment to subscribe to our website in case we get deplatformed from social media. Head to artistasfamily.is and click on the subscribe tab. Just prior to Christmas, Professor Jem Bendell, a social scientist at Cumbria University in the north of England, uncovered how vaccine effectiveness statistics are manipulated and how they are used to justify vaccine confidence, coercion and mandates. He wrote up his findings in a post entitled Lies, Damn Lies and Hospitalisation Statistics. Professor Bandel is famous for his big picture grief producing essay, Deep Adaptation, A Map for Navigating Climate Tragedy, which is complementary work to what we've been producing over the years, such as our adaptation essay, Replacing Growth with Belonging Economies, that was written as a chapter published in a recent academic text, Food for Degrowth, Perspectives and Practices. Both Bendel's work and ours is focused on meta-narratives of economy, social relations, labour, land and place relations. And while we agree specialisation is important, it should not cancel out more generalist approaches that can put things into greater perspective, an argument that cartoonist Graham Mackay attempts to represent here. For the past year, we have been following the findings from Israel, one of the world's most vaccinated countries, who were several months ahead of Australia's vaccine rollout. Israel's COVID medical expert panel, as reported in the New York Times on Christmas Day, speak to the ineffectiveness of Pfizer's vaccine, which has been used exclusively in that country. The panel pointed to signs of waning immunity a few months after the third shot and said that any delay in additional doses might prove too late to protect those most at risk. But some experts in the group warned that the plan could backfire because too many shots might cause a sort of immune system fatigue, compromising the body's ability to fight the coronavirus. In our last video, we asked, are the vaccines lowering immunity? A question medical specialists, at least in Israel, are thankfully now asking. Up until this moment, we have gone along with the story that although the vaccines are not reducing cases in any meaningful way, and therefore not stopping transmission, they are most likely reducing hospitalizations. But what have we based this on? Probably government statistics. Well, that was before we read Professor Bendel's lies, damn lies and hospitalization statistics, which prompted us to dive into the literature ourselves. Professor Bendel went looking for the methodology that determined the often touted figure that vaccination reduces hospitalizations by 90%. All around the world, this figure of 90% against hospitalisation is used to mount the argument that vaccines are effective and thus justifying mandates. An example is found in the CDC report from September, where the authors conclude that vaccine effectiveness against COVID-19 hospitalisation during March 11th to August 15th, 2021 was higher for the Moderna vaccine at 93% than the Pfizer vaccine at 88%. So about 90%, right? But how did they arrive at that figure? Professor Bendel discovered the particular formula used to skew the numbers. This, of course, is not uncommon in medicine. In a previous video, we referred to Dr. Marianne de Marcy's article, COVID-19, Vaccine Benefits Exaggerated, Say Experts, where she uncovers how data sets are manipulated for the general public. Referenced from this Lancet Journal editorial, she quotes, the Pfizer vaccine has a relative risk reduction of 95%, but an absolute risk reduction of 0.84%. Of course, we know which figure has been amplified and which has not. Which do you think would sell more vaccines, the RRR or the ARR percentage figure? In a video called This Is How Easy It Is To Lie With Statistics, a YouTube explainer gives an easy to understand example. If, let's say hypothetically, the high school dropout rates of a certain country go from 5% one year to 10%, is that a 5% increase or a 100% increase? Because if you're at 5% and you add 5, you get to 10%, obviously. But if you're making, let's say, $5 an hour and you get a 100% raise, you'll be at $10 an hour. So which one of these is it? Professor Bendel's post tracks his deep dive into uncovering the magical 90% figure the UK Health Security Agency Week 50 report, where he began his investigation, 
does not compare, he writes, numbers of unvaccinated and vaccinated patients in hospital with rates of vaccination in the country. Rather, the agency produces its findings with a completely different methodology called test negative case control analysis. Professor Bendell found that the test negative case control approach compares vaccination status in persons with symptomatic COVID with vaccination status in persons who reported symptoms but had a negative test. That is when I had my moment of dumbfoundedness, he writes. Why have people who tested negative for COVID in hospital got anything to do with an assessment of vaccine effectiveness? If someone does not have COVID, then there could be any number of reasons why they do not have it. So let me get this straight. Let's say you and I are both vaccinated and we both have COVID-like symptoms and we both go to get tested. You test positive and I test negative. But the reason that gets recorded for my negative test result is that I'm vaccinated, not that I have a robust immune system or any other complex variable. Wow, you could really stack on the numbers there. You really could. Professor Bendell trawls through dozens of papers, hoping to uncover the equation for the methodology. Tracking back through many references, he finally reaches the source in a 2013 paper, The Test Negative Design, Validity, Accuracy and Precision of the Vaccine Efficacy Estimates Compared to the Gold Standard of Randomised Placebo-Controlled Clinical Trials. Professor Bendell explains, they take the ratio of vaccinated to unvaccinated positive cases and divide it by the ratio in the negative cases. He then quotes the equation they came up with as it is now employed for SARS-CoV-2. Vaccine effectiveness equals one minus vaccinated and positive for COVID divided by unvaccinated and positive for COVID divided by vaccinated and negative for COVID divided by unvaccinated and negative for COVID. The formula is effectively set up to prove vaccine effectiveness, but doesn't refer to real world data. From this method, Bendel continues, researchers created a nice 88% figure for the reduction of hospitalizations due to vaccination. Lies, damn lies, and medical statistics, huh? How could the whole medical establishment be so creative with the stats on something so important? Rather than doing proper science with clinical trials, the pharmaceutical companies get the data they desire to promote their products. Unbelievable. But at the same time, hardly surprising, right? In this era of corporate government collusion, we each need to be critically aware how industry manipulation, capture and medical censorship work hand in hand as a dynamic trio. In previous videos, we have drawn people's attention to the gag orders placed on doctors in Australia. And we have examined the capture of medicine by Big Pharma through groups such as the Australian Immunisation Coalition, who are a vaccine promotion company set up to fight vaccine hesitancy. Such an organisation is, in effect, more ideological than scientific. Imagine fighting for something that relies on the belief that every vaccine has the same efficacy or value and that over-prescribing is not a real medical problem that exists in our society. This group is, of course, sponsored by Big Pharma, as we can see here in plain sight. Yet, they're taken seriously in the medical industry and have key medical scientists and doctors in their fold to feign credibility. This is what it means for doctors and scientists to be captured by industry. Similarly, this mob, Medicines Australia, are the main dating agency for medicos and big pharma in this country, as we exposed also in this video. While we have previously revealed big pharma COVID profits for companies and shareholders, we haven't yet revealed in this series of videos the money that doctors and pharmacists are making in the COVID jab industry. Administers of vaccines in Australia, such as general practices and pharmacies, receive around $70 for every double jab person. So the incentives are high for doctors and pharmacists to push vaccines in a country of 27 million people. Almost 19 million people have so far had two doses in Australia. Therefore, the total revenue raised for doctors and pharmacists by the end of 2021 is around $1.3 billion. In his post, Professor Bendell investigates who came up with the test negative methodology in the 2013 Euro surveillance piece. I realised, he writes, one of its main aims was to promote the novel way of proving vaccine effectiveness by addressing concerns about its validity. 
Previously, I had not paid attention to the authors or their statement of funding or relevant interests. Here are those glaring conflicts laid out at the end of the report. The lead author, Gaston de Serre, received research grants from GlaxoSmithKline and Sanofi Pasteur. Christopher Ambrose and Xiong Hua Wilson Wu are MedImmune employees, a research arm of AstraZeneca. They have effectively pushed a formula for proving vaccine effectiveness. Therefore, writes Professor Bendel, although the method was invented earlier than 2013, the key article explaining and defending the method as something that can be used instead of clinical trials and that is referenced by so many of the papers that are referenced in the relevant official reports was written by employees and grantees of the pharmaceutical companies profiting from the products whose effectiveness are being reported on. Supporting Bendel's findings, we found this large-scale peer-reviewed investigation titled Association Between Immune Dysfunction and COVID-19 Breakthrough Infection After SARS-CoV-2 Vaccination in the US that was recently published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. It compares the outcomes of 17,262 vaccinated people with breakthrough infections seen at academic medical centres across the US between early December 2020 and mid-September 2021 with a much larger group of COVID patients, over 2.7 million people, who were not vaccinated and visited the same centres at any point during the same nine-month period. The data shows 84% of vaccinated patients were seen as outpatients, while almost 16% required hospitalisation. By comparison, 77% of unvaccinated patients were seen as outpatients, while 23% were hospitalised. This real-world data implies only a 7% reduction in hospitalisation due to vaccination, not the 90% that the test-negative control case formula sets out to prove. Furthermore, this large investigation does not include information about adverse events post-vaccination. Is there any real world benefit, especially considering the need to keep jabbing people year after year with leaky products and the concerns we mentioned earlier from Israeli experts about immune system fatigue caused by the vaccines? <laughs> Professor Bendel ends with a call to arms. We need to rescue medical science from the corporations that have captured the bureaucracies and brains of people working in the medical profession. While the counter argument to this presentation might be, how do we account then for a majority of unvaccinated people ending up in ICUs? We would respond by stating, question the figures and the timing of such reports. Vaccines only offer a fleeting moment of immunity to individuals. When this immunity occurs after a mass immunization push, then for a short while, it looks like unvaccinated people are the only ones filling up ICUs. The media, of course, pounces on this and amplifies it, as they did in Australia in early December. They do not say, however, the great majority of unvaccinated people who end up in ICUs have chronic comorbidities. They do not report that these people might be hedging their bets between being tipped over the edge by COVID or by experimental gene therapies, as we can see in the data in the six month follow up in the Pfizer trial, where there were 15 deaths in the vaccine group and 14 in the placebo or unvaccinated group. In Pfizer trials, few had comorbidities and few were elderly. Most participants were considered healthy normals. What is conspicuous right now, though, is the record breaking case numbers in the most vaccinated parts of Australia. Well, that's the story for the week. If you'd like to support our work, please head to artistersfamily.is and click on the support tab. Many thanks to those who generously gave last week and in previous weeks, because your contributions enable us to keep making these videos.